Hello, comrades, and welcome to the podcast you are currently listening to. I promise, this isn't a Russian invasion, just a temporary occupation. I'm Roberto, one of the hosts of the podcast, Czar Power. And I'm Brendan, the other half of the podcast. Together, we're ranking the Russian rulers from Rurik to Putin. They will compete based on how well they fought, how successful they were in life, how much kompromat, or blackmail, they had on them, how handsome they were, and how long they ruled for. After being scored, we decide whether they get to party it out in the Kremlin or get sent straight to the Gulag. Those who make it to the Kremlin will need to duke it out for the position of best Russian ruler. You can find us on any podcast host as Tsar Power, on Twitter at Tsar Power Pod, and on Facebook as Tsar Power. That's Tsar spelled T-S-A-R. Now, back to your regularly scheduled podcast. And if you hear a knock on your door, beware. The KGB is coming to make your stay a bit more permanent. Michelle. And welcome to another episode of Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, Bishop Morton. Mm -hmm. What's his first name? John. John. Oh, that's a simple name. Yes. (laughs) Doesn't get simpler. Not Erasmus or... (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Not even Reginald. (laughs) John. Just John. Just John. Come with me, if you will. The wind is lashing outside. The rain beats against the window. Three men sit around the fire, discussing what's to be done with Rich the Third. We must consolidate all the uprisings across the south and rise as one big rebellion, says one. We should contact the men of Kent and get their allegiance, says the other. Or I could just put a spell on him, says the third. <laughs> The extraordinary thing about John Morton is that I was more than halfway through the first book I read about him when I realised that he was already over 60. Really? He packs a lot into the last years of his life. He packs a fair amount into the first years of his life. Oh. Morton was the man closest to Henry. Just like Just Reginald? as we've heard that right. Reginald Just Bray like was Bishop the man closest to Henry. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what we find out is that every single one of them told their biographer, I was the closest to Henry. He trusted me. He yeah. told me everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Mortons were landed gentry in Dorset, and his mother was Elizabeth Turberville. And there is a link between Turberville and Tess of the Durberville. Oh. It's a Dorset family, and uh, Hardy was obviously quite taken with the name and used it for the book. Hmm. The Turpervilles came from Beer Regis in Dorset, where there is now a boss in the ceiling of the parish church showing a very puffy-faced Morton. He's got a big round face. (laughs) Aww. But I suppose if you're the boss from people who don't know, it's um, it's a bit that covers up where the when four, four pieces of wood come together and there's a joint in the middle. Okay. Um, you stick a boss on the on the top so you can't see all the joints. Right. And they made it as they always did in medieval times. They made it decorative. They often put a flower or an angel. Uh, okay. And this one's got a gert, puffy face of John <laughs> Morton. <laughs> but, when we come to look at his picture, we'll find that the other picture we got of me show, shows him really gaunt, like Bishop oh. Fox. But I suppose if you've got to fill a round thing, you're not going to fill it with a, a gaunt face. face. You're going to fin- fill it with a great moon face. Yeah. We think Morton was born around 1420. And he might have been educated at Cern Abbey or possibly at home. So you can tell he wasn't that important at this, <laughs> t- at this time. <laughs> We've only got this information from a 17th century antiquarian, Anthony Wood, 
And he didn't back this up with any evidence. Oh, so he could have just made it up. Well, yes, it seems more likely that as a child, Morton would be educated privately at home because that's what children Most, of his class were, yeah. or boys of his class. What was his class? They were landed gentry. Hmm. So, so he didn't get swapped with other people. Oh, I guess the landed gentry didn't. Did they do that? I'm not sure. Apparently not, if he was rich. Well, if the guy made it up, yeah. <laughs> we don't know. He could he could have been. Um, I mean, if you if you live quite close to Cern Abbey, I think it was meant to be a centre of learning, centre of excellence. Yes, for and learning. And he wouldn't have been sent off to somebody else if he was earmarked for the church as a young child, which they also did. Um, that. What does it mean to be yeah. earmarked? Did somebody actually come oh, along it's... with a sharpie and mark your ear? <laughs> I think it's you know when you fold down a corner of a book oh, to make a little yeah. ear. I think that's probably it. Oh, don't do that to books. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bookmark. I'm afraid I I bully my books oh. rather. <laughs> as soon as I get them, I break the spine. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, if they still say the same things in them, <laughs> they <laughs> they're do. just easier to read. They also fall apart, though. They do, yeah. What we do know is that he studied in, at Oxford. Okay. Probably at Balliol, possibly at Exeter. So either he had a patron Oxford. or his family was wealthy enough to send him off to Oxford. Hmm. Mm. There's no mention of a patron, hmm. but there's no mention of much at this point. Yeah. In 1448, he got a degree in civil law and was made a fellow of Peckwater Inn, which is not something I'd come across before. No, it doesn't sound like one of the four inns. No, it's not. And this was later brought up by Wolsey and it became part of his Cardinal College. Oh. But apparently the main quad at Christchurch College, Oxford, is called Peckwater Quadrangle, or the Peck, for those in the know, which I've been to Christchurch many times. I've never heard of that. Hmm. Well, now you're in the know. I am in the know, yes. Mm -hmm. Next time I go to go to Christchurch, I shall be able to point and, and say loudly. <laughs> <That's the laughs> this peck. is called the peck to those of us in the know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's interesting he chose to study law and not theology. But it shows oh, yeah. that law was on the rise at this time. Families were seeing having a son who was knowledgeable about the law as it was going to be quite useful to them. Yeah, well, for how often they were in court. Well, I was thinking, wonder if it was a reflection on how litigious they were. Yeah. That they thought, yeah, if we get a lawyer as a son, we don't have to pay anybody. Morton was an exceptional student. And what would he have studied there? At this time, they were still required to study the Corpus Juris Civilis or Civilis, Body of Civil Law, codified by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I in 529 to 34. Hmm. And also the Digest, an encyclopedia written by Roman jurists. There were medieval texts too, but it's, it's interesting they're still making use of Roman law. Of course. Well, they love their Romans, but... Still speaking Latin. Morton practised as a proctor in the Chancellor's Court at Oxford from 1448, and a proctor is a legal practitioner in an ecclesiastical court. Obviously, I look that oh. up. <laughs> so he was sort of in the church at that time. He was a lawyer in the church court. Okay. And the chancellors of universities had jurisdiction over everyone who studied at or worked in the university. They could try criminal cases involving scholars and citizens. So they, got, they had a lot more authority than they have now. I'm surprised at the citizens. I thought citizens would have been pulled to civil court, not an ecclesiastical mm. court. Yeah. Interesting. Unless it's, unless it's a, um, a dispute between a student and a, and a citizen. Uh, hmm. Interesting. In 1451, Morton was acting as deputy and official of the Chancellor of the University, one George Neville. Oh, the Nevilles. Yeah, Richard Neville, mm -hmm. Earl of Warwick's brother. And he was made Archbishop of York. And if you want to, if you want to see a ridiculous amount of food, go on to Wikipedia and look up George Neville and see what they ate at his inauguration as the Bishop of York. It goes on and on oh. and on. And he was the one, he also spent some time as a prisoner in Ham Castle with John de Vere. Hmm. 
So, yeah, there's a potted history of George Neville. Morton then became principal of Peckwater Inn. So, obviously, a lot's happened in between there. He's, one minute he's just, he's just arrived and suddenly he's principal. Yeah. He, soon after, practised in the Court of Arches. Court of Arches? Yeah, it's, it's, apparently it was so-called because it met in the London parish of Mary Le Beau, or Mary Le Beau, Beau being an arch, like rainbow. Okay. And this dealt with wills, marriages, titles, you know, all that sort of thing. And Morton was very diligent. Quote, he was so industrious and elaborate that he obtained the name of the well-sounding bell of St Mary's, and glad was that client that he took in hand, unquote. Hmm. So he's been likened to a bell. <laughs> Ding. But it's a very famous bell. It's the bell that Dick Whittington, who is unknown to people outside England, if they don't weren't dragged to Pantos every nope. Christmas. <laughs> Not a clue. <laughs> well, he was just walking away from London and he had the bells of bow. And he thought, I'll give it another go. It's all been disastrous up to then. And then he became thrice Lord Mayor of London. Hmm. And it appears in the rhyme Oranges and Lemons. To the bells of St. Clement's. I do not know, said the great Bell of Bow. And if you're born within earshot of the Bell of Bow, you can horn yourself a cockney. Ah. Like Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> um, so for Morton to be likened to the Bell of St. Mary's was quite a compliment, I presume. <laughs> yeah, I don't... I don't see... I don't get it. <laughs> I don't, no. It, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, you're likened to the bell. Are you loud and annoying and ring constantly? <laughs> <laughs> um, Does dependable? it have a lovely sound? Maybe. Maybe yeah, dependable. Possibly. But how is, it, how is a bell not dependable? Somebody rings it, it rings. <laughs> I don't get this. If you don't ring it, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, I imagine he was pleased. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it means. <laughs> Morton was lucky to receive... Thomas, I never know whether this is Borchier or Birchier. Thomas, Bur I'll go with Borchier's patronage. And he was Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Chancellor. Because Archbishop of Canterbury were usually Lord Chancellor as well. Lord Chancellor to who? Edward? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Or are we still at Henry VI? Oh, Henry, Henry. Sorry, Henry, yes. Okay. And it was because of Borchier, Borchier, that Morton was soon hearing cases of appeal and he was appointed by Henry VI to investigate abuses at the hospital of St John the Baptist in Oxford. And I checked this and was pleased to find out that it was abuse of power, okay. not abuse of the inmates. That's my next question. Yeah. Yes. You never want to hear abuse and hospital. <laughs> yes. Mm. No, he was um, sending off the vestments, apparently. Oh. Yeah, it seems... Very, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> compared compared to abusing patients. Yes. Yeah, and other things we've happened. covered, that is very small. <laughs> yeah, I'm not bothered. <laughs> Unless the people are now running around naked because the best things <laughs> have been gone. I don't want to see that, thanks. <laughs> Morton was then made Chancellor of the Duchy of Cornwall, which is a prestigious job since the Duchy of Cornwall was, of course, the Prince of Wales. Yes. Edward, who was... Or possibly wasn't the son of Henry the Sixth. <laughs> one day, one day we will be. No, we won't be able to do DNA testing for him. We don't know where he is. His body's disappeared, hasn't it? Uh, what Edwards? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, go and look into that. Uh huh. When he was, he was definitely the son of Margaret von Schu. Anyway, <laughs> we don't have to. We don't have to worry about that one. That's hard not to prove. <laughs> <laughs> In 1545, Morton was ordained, and he received a large number of benefices, as these people always do, including Rector of Maiden Newton in Dorset, and he got a papal dispensation allowing him to hold two incompatible benefices. Incompatible? Yep. Well, what that means, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm guessing that it's sort of accepting the fact that it wasn't possible to fulfil his role in both parishes. Ah. Uh. But then... You know, who does? Who does fulfil their role? Oh, nobody at this time. No, I'm sure no. there were probably very diligent people out there. We just don't cover them because nobody said anything about them. They did their job. They probably only got the one parish and yeah. Yeah, worked very hard for their parishioners. But no, he amassed position after position. 
And um, in all, he held at least seven prebendaries and wow. seven archdeaconries. Wow. He was just given them. They're cheap, aren't they? Sinecures. Yes, they're, they're nice and cheap. Yeah. So the, the king doesn't have to reward you in any way. He just says, yeah, have a, have a prebendary. Yeah. And people will pay you for doing nothing and it won't be me paying you. Yes, it doesn't mm-hmm. cost me anything. Mm-hmm. You're, you're very pleased, and I'm very pleased not to have to pay for it. So everybody's happy. Uh, yeah, I don't know why you had to get the papal dispensation for just two incompatible posts, because surely most of these were incompatible. Yes, you can't do all of them. No. no. He was almost given a bishopric. The Bishop of St David's in Wales, which is made of a strange purple sandstone... It's quite pretty. Wanted to retire. Oh, that's not the bishop was made. It's true. Purple sandstone. <laughs> <laughs> the cathedral is. <laughs> you Sorry, I'm so the... confused. I was like, what? The bishop of St. David's. <laughs> St. David's is made of a, <laughs> of a purple sandstone. It's quite strange. It's odd to see a purple cathedral. We're doing so good this morning. <laughs> <laughs> And his reasons for wanting to retire were, quote, he's very old and infirm and becomes daily more unable to bear the care of the pontifical rite, which on account of the wildness of the country is full of rude and uncivilised people, unquote. Oh, mean. Yeah. I've been to St David's. Didn't They weren't especially rude and uncivilised. <laughs> <laughs> it rained a lot, I know that. <laughs> Only one pub in St David's. Strange for a city, but there we go, just the one pub. How busy is it? Very. Yeah. (laughs) Business opportunity, people. Yes. Lots of little tea shops and things, but only one pub. The Pope called for an investigation to find out if Morton would be suitable and if Henry VI would be likely to petition for him to take on the role. It may have been that St David's was seen as being too far flung. It's right the far west of wales so it's a long oh, way away so he might have not wanted it because it was too far away i guess if you if it's that far away you'd get stuck there and you wouldn't be promoted Nah, mm. you, you can't network no. i know it's far far west because we were going to cycle across wales and we caught the train to fishguard uh-huh. and then we thought we'd cycle from fishguard to st david so we were starting right in the far west yeah. so we're not cheating we're, we're going right to the far, far west as we could go but what we didn't realize i should have had my geological map because there was a volcano there at some time not now and there was a dike swarm and you haven't done geology probably remember the dike swarm is when a volcano it sort of gets grooved it gets yep a sort of waviness around the side. So when the volcano um, is eroded away, these grooves stay as hills and down and, and up and yes, down. And very up and down. steep too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So that was our very first day of cycling across Wales. <laughs> and you were like, <laughs> can't do this anymore. This is hill number three. Completely 50. unfit. <laughs> Rob hadn't cycled for years. So we were very pleased to see St David's. And it was pouring rain. Anyway. uh, Yeah, he didn't get the St David's job because maybe there were other plans being made for him because he was quite a high flyer. But also they were overtaken by history because poor Henry VI became ill. Ah. Richard, Duke of York, stepped into the breach. Yes. And everyone had other things on their mind rather than who was going to be Bishop of St David's. So probably that poor bloke that must have got stuck there with his uncivilised and rude <laughs> people. <laughs> Thinking, I just want to get out. Morton was Privy Councillor and Chancellor to Prince Edward, so he was right in the thick of things. Oh. The king recovered and decided to heal all the factionalism in that endearingly inept way. Of, <laughs> the love day. Of, um, the love day. Margaret of Anjou joined hands with the Duke of York and each member of one faction was paired off with a member of the other and they walked through London in a lovely exhibition of solidarity. Now hug it out. <laughs> <laughs> and we can see how well that went from this quote from Gregory's Chronicle. Quote, and that same year all the lords departed from the Parliament 
but they come never altogether after that time to no parliament nor council, but if it were in a field with spear and shield, oh, unquote. Dear. Yeah. It wasn't Tragic work, failure. Was it? Could sort of see it coming, couldn't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> that never works. <laughs> I'm not going to give a blow-by-blow blow account of the Wars of the Roses because <laughs> they were very long. We have it on our website, so if you're interested, go and read that. I'll just talk about Morton's role in, in it. Um, in 1459, the Queen heard that Richard, Duke of York, was planning to come to the King to declare his loyalty. And that was the last thing she wanted. <laughs> so she set off to intercept him. Her son Edward was with her, and since he was in Edward's employ, so would Morton. Oh, okay. Edward would have been about six, so not a lot of help on the battlefield, apart from his mascot, I suppose. Mm -hmm. The Queen's troops were defeated at the Battle of Blore Heath, but the Duke of York was still stressing his loyalty to the King, despite having just done battle with the King's wife. Yes, but that's the Queen, not the King. Yeah, and you could say it wasn't his fault. I mean, she'd engaged him in battle. Yes. But it's still quite surprising that Henry VI offered to pardon York if he sent his troops away. Hmm. And it could be there was no alternative for Henry. He's in a weak position. He was just weak. Yeah, well, he wasn't well. But it was quite academic anyway, since York rejected the pardon anyway. I'm going to say that again without so many anyways. But it was quite <laughs> academic since, since York rejected the pardon anyway. The Great Council convened in Coventry in June 1459, where at the Queen's insistence the Yorkist lords were proclaimed traitors. And it was Morton's job, alongside others, to draw up the Acts of Attainder with his legal training. And they then had to work on a document defending what they had done, which seems extraordinary. A king having to justify attainting a man who was actually engaged in battle with the queen. Wow. It really shows the weakness of his position. Wow. And this was written as a fictionalised conversation between a Yorkist and a Lancastrian, which is always a good way of doing it because you can put rubbish in your opponent's <laughs> mouth, can't you? <laughs> And make them get completely confused in their argument and then wham, you come in and flatten them. <laughs> Morton's stance was that obedience to the king was vital if the kingdom were to remain secure. And I have to say, that's not a position he held when Richard III was on the throne. Oh. But we'll come to that. Obviously, having been a co-writer of both the Attainders and the Defence, this did put Morton in the firing line once the Yorkists were in power. Oh, yeah. Mm. The Yorkists fled, but then they came back. So that's a really whistle-stop to, to <laughs> Wars, of, Wars of the Roses. <laughs> they met the King's troops at Northampton and won the battle, as they usually did. I mean, I was quite st struck when I looked into the Wars of the Roses how few battles the Lancastrians won. And yet still managed to come back a couple of times. Yeah, minimal. And this was the point where the King was taken prisoner. The Queen and Prince Edward had been left in Kenilworth, so that's presumably where Morton would have been. And when they heard the news, Margaret and Edward fled to Wales to seek the help of Jasper Tudor. And we don't know whether Morton went with them, but probably. Yeah. He's an appendage. There's a lot of probably at this point, yes. <laughs> Come on, Morton, off we go. <laughs> <laughs> on 25th October, it was announced that Henry would remain king, but that York would take over on the king's death, which is not an agreement you ever really want to make, since you might just as well paint a target on your back. Yes. And also, Henry had just done his son out of his birthright. Yes. Margaret was understandably livid. Yes. Prince Edward, or rather, since he was only eight, his advisers, which would include Morton, drafted a letter which announced that they were coming to London since York had, quote, an untrue pretense to claim, unquote, and promising that when they arrived, no one would be robbed. Right. You would have thought that would be an unnecessary thing for Prince of Wales to have to tell his, his own people. His people. Yes. Prince William doesn't have to do that when he visits a city. Don't worry, I'm not, not going to rob you. <laughs> but rumours had been put around by York of the malevolent intentions of Margaret's army. 
and no one in London felt they could risk believing what the prince, in inverted commas, said. So during the clash that followed this, York was killed, the Earl of Salisbury, York's brother-in-law, was executed, and York's youngest son, Rutland, was killed. So a bit of a disaster for the Yorkist side Just there. a bit. But the death of York didn't bring peace because his son, Edward Earl of March, was able to step into his dad's boots. And now he had the added, added incentive that his father and brother had been killed. Mm. So he would carry on the fight and revenge his family. Margaret decided it was time to crush the Yorkists once and for all. And she enlisted the help of Scottish soldiers. And in return, she handed over Berwick to Scotland. Berwick on Tweed. Mm. That poor town. <laughs> you can have yes. it. No, you can have it. No, you can have it. Yes. What are we today? <laughs> I don't know. Do I say yes or I? I'm not sure. <laughs> Morton doesn't seem to have been with Margaret when she was in Scotland, but he met her later in Durham. And we know this because he acted as a guarantor for a loan for her. Because oh. I think she's a woman you just don't say no to. No. She? <laughs> Whatever Prince Edward, in inverted commas, had said about not looting London... That didn't extend to all the other towns they passed through on their way south. Which, of course, is going to get you so much support. Yes, yes. It's not a good start to their campaign. No. Grantham, Stamford, Peterborough, Huntingdon and several other towns and cities were ransacked. Goodness. Churches and monasteries were looted. The trouble was, I think, that many of the soldiers were Scottish. So as far as they were concerned, they were just carrying on the age-old game of let's maraud around England. Yeah. And Morton appears to have been with them. And he was a clergyman. Well, I don't know. What was his opinion of their behaviour? Was he in a position to try and put a stop to it? Probably not. No. Would you really want to tell people who are armed that they should... Naughty, naughty, don't do that. Yes. yes. No. Yeah. Then we had the Battle of St Albans, where Warwick was defeated and Margaret was able to scoop Henry VI up and take him home. And then they couldn't get into London because the Londoners weren't idiots. They'd heard what had happened in Peterborough and Stamford and they didn't believe Prince Edward, in about a commas, promises that there'd be no looting. Morton suggested sending in an embassy to negotiate terms, but the ambassadors weren't allowed in the city either. So it must have been particularly galling to watch as the gates were thrown open to Edward out of March and he just wandered in. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> yes. I brought some wine. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't there long. He tracked Margaret and Henry's troops to Taunton, the bloodiest battle in on British soil. And Morton may have been there, but it seems more likely he was in York with Henry and Margaret out of harm's way since we know he fled with them when the news of the Lancastrian defeat reached them. Yeah, it would be a little hard for him to flee with them if he was in the battle. Yes. Unless he's the one that brought the news. Possibly. He certainly doesn't sound like a fighter. We don't hear no. of him fighting. The royal family headed for Berwick again. He's a churchman. He can't be a fighter. <laughs> well, <laughs> think of Pope Julius II. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I take different that back. times, different mm -hmm. times. Morton hoped to escape to Scotland by sea, but they were caught in Cockermouth. What? Which is a place, not a not a, <laughs> not a restraint position. <laughs> okay. I think it's in Yorkshire. Morton was the only cleric among the twenty-two men who were excluded from the pardon once Edward the Fourth gained the throne. And we've seen how ridiculously forgiving Edward could be. So he must have had very strong feelings about Morton. Yeah. And I assume that's because he drafted the attainters for... Um, his brother and his dad. Yeah. Hmm. Morton was accused of, quote, treasons, insurrections and other offences, unquote, and he was sent south to the Tower of London. Edward had already executed the Earl of Wiltshire, so Morton must have been expecting the same penalty. Gosh. Or at the very least, a, a long stretch in the Tower. I'd rather option two, please. Option two. But Morton escaped. Really? How he escaped is really exciting swashbuckling story. Uh-oh. At <laughs> least, I, pres I presume it must have been. We don't know. We have no idea. 
We don't know how he escaped, where he escaped from, who helped him. We, we don't know any of it. We will say he escaped the same way the original bishop did. He brought in, he smuggled in ropes in wine, got his guards drunk, then climbed out the window on the rope, which was too short, and dropped the last bit before he scrambled away. He is quite... I was sort of, Swashbuckling doesn't quite cover it, I don't think. It's, um, I mean, he's certainly intrepid and brave. Very brave. Although I still see him in a suit. I still see him, him and Reginald Bray, I still see them as suit men. Mm -hmm. And yet both of them were involved in all sorts of underhand activities, secretive yeah. things. Bray was. Morton was as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, he might have used his extensive network of contacts to so get away. So we have no idea. But he went abroad, and in his, in his absence, he was attainted, and a hundred pound bounty was offered for his capture. Really, that's the first I've heard of a bounty, other than for Richard and Edward de la Pole, Edmund de la Pole. I mean, a hundred pound. Hundred pounds. Hundred pound. I mean, yes. Morton now did a Francis Lovell. Many of his companions accept the situation as it now was. I mean, it was harder for Morton because Edward had decided not to pardon him, but he could have just bided his time abroad and then waited until all was forgiven. And then he could have come home and got on with his life. Do you think that actually would have happened? Edward seems to have forgiven people that you'd think, why? Why have you done yes. that? He's obviously going to rebel again. He hasn't said, I'm sorry, Yeah. you know, a slap on the wrist, I shan't do it again. Yeah. And we see it time and time again. And then and you think, yeah, I mean, he would figure if John de Vere, I mean, admittedly, John de, it wasn't his John de Vere's crime. It was his father and his brother. Mm -hmm. But it was quite obvious that John de Vere was going to be slightly miffed that his <laughs> parents had been executed. <laughs> miffed. <laughs> I'm quite put out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Morton said no, shan't, shan't do that. And it may have been because he was so close to the royal family. Quote, he had been fast upon the party of King Henry while that party was in wealth, and nevertheless left it not, nor forsook it in woe, unquote. It's possible he may have seen Edward's rule as a temporary thing, because Henry's still alive. Right. So he could make a comeback. Uh, Morton may not have wanted to have to explain to him why he'd abandoned him at the first opportunity. Yeah. Meanwhile, Margaret of Anjou had sailed to Brittany, and Morton met her there, and he became keeper of the Privy <laughs> Seal, which was a hugely trusted position. Yes. They met Louis XI. What you, what's she doing with the Privy Seal? She's, she, they're, not, they're not in power anymore. No, but maybe she took it with her, hoping that they wouldn't Stuffed be able to make it. Stuffed it in her pocket, yes. yes. <laughs> They met Louis XI, and he was all in favour of Margaret carrying on her campaign. It wasn't that he particularly believed in her cause, but having England ripping itself to pieces... It's helpful. It's, it's not a bad idea. It's handy. So they're not pestering him. Yep. 28th of June, 1462, a treaty was signed by Margaret and by Morton. And this is significant because there was a secret article in this treaty in which Calais was to be mortgaged for 20,000 livres. Oh, yeah. I mean, for Margaret to sign this is understandable. She was desperate and had nothing to lose. But for Morton to sign it seems to me more extraordinary. Well, he doesn't really have anything to lose either. No, I suppose I'm thinking she's French, ultimately. Ah, and he's not. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just thinking her allegiances might be torn, but... Yeah. Yeah, it's just that, I mean, it's the last English place on the continent, and he's happy to sign it over to Louis. Hmm. Maybe he felt so bitter. Margaret and Morton, and others, sailed to Northumbria, and this was a tremendously brave thing for Morton to do. Or oh, an incredibly stupid one. It's often a very fine line between those. A price was on his head, a bounty, and he'd already Wait. been sent to the Tower, and presumably Edward was planning to execute him. And yet he came back to England. Well, he did come back to England with military force. Yes, but even so, as we'll find, they don't last long because he's joined no, the garrison at Dunstanburg Castle 
that as Edward approached, the Lancastrians just sort of melted away. Yeah. And Morton had to make a run for it to Scotland again. Hmm. So if he'd been caught... It, that would have been it. That'd be it, yeah. yeah. Then in July 1463, he sailed with Margaret to that place that we don't know how to pronounce, Sluis. 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 That place, anyway. And they converged on her father's castle in Lorraine. It sort of sounds like, you know, we'll all crash at Dad's place. <laughs> <laughs> Slumber party. No, Dad won't mind. <laughs> Morton was part of a 200-strong band of loyalists. But he didn't remain idle while he was waiting to reinstate Henry. He went to the University of Louvain, where, in 1469, he got a degree in theology. He's never one to just sort of sit and wait. Wow, but where did he get the money for that? Well, I don't know. I don't know, maybe he made sure that he had his pockets full when he left England. Yeah, but how heavy the money was. Now it's paper. <laughs> yeah, it's not even <laughs> that, then is it? Was it? metal. <laughs> Um, Some places it's still paper. U.S. is mm. still... Well, or is there's like a fabric cotton? I don't know. It feels like paper. Canada's is plastic now. Plastic and metal. We've got plasticky stuff and it, they, they slither about. They slither out of your pocket too easily. Yeah, it's probably a good move to get this degree because it was beginning to look as if he might never get home. And given a, getting a qualification would be recognised in the low countries. Probably quite sensible. Mm-hmm. But luckily for the Lancastrians, Edward IV and the Earl of Warwick fell out. And a document was drawn up by Morton, amongst others, that agreed to the plan for Warwick's daughter Anne to marry Margaret's son, Edward. And interestingly, this document was drawn up before the time when Warwick was kept kneeling by Margaret to humiliate him before she'd agreed to oh. their working together. Oh, Yes, it turns out that that was entire... Well, we knew it was show, really, because, you know, these things tend to be... Yeah. But it was entirely show, because it was all done yes. and dusted by that point. I hope she... I, I really hope Anne was treated okay by Edward. They they I don't make her treated okay in any of the shows. I think Edward was the only time we've ever sworn on this, this podcast. The only time I've ever had to yes, keep anything he's... out. Not a nice person. We decided we didn't like him very much, but he'd not had a very good upbringing on the whole. No. They were betrothed on the 25th July at Angers, and Morton was a witness. Warwick went back to England, and now it was Edward IV's turn to flee. And Morton may have gone back with Warwick, but we're not sure. It seems to so much of... We're not quite sure where he is at this point. <laughs> a near contemporary chronicler said that Morton was at the Battle of Barnet. And that's the one where there's all that confusion about the banners and the Earl of Oxford starting to attack their own side. And is it the sun in splendour or is it the star, star? And they can't. It all took place in fog and it got confused. And yeah. what should have been a shoe in just became a complete failure. So. Morton then went to the south coast to meet the Queen and Prince, who had yet had that usual traumatic crossing from France, since we know that the English Channel is the most dangerous piece of water in, in the world, to tell her that it had been a disaster. And Margaret was all for going back to France, but her son convinced her to go on. And then they were trounced at the Battle of Tewkesbury, where Prince Edward was killed and William Stanley brought the news to Margaret in that caring way of his. Hey, your son's dead. <laughs> Suck it up, you're finished <laughs> <laughs> oh, He was a lovely man, wasn't he, William Stanley? <laughs> and then just three weeks later, Henry died, quote, of pure displeasure and melancholy, unquote Edward IV was back on the throne, but now there was no one to challenge him And where did that leave Morton? Hanging high and dry Well... I would think he is completely hooped. Yeah, you might think so, given that he was almost constantly with the royal family and he'd already escaped from prison. Yes. He'd repeatedly fought against the Yorkists. I mean, what could yes. he do now? Well, bizarrely, given that Edward was rounding up Henry's supporters and imprisoning them, he decided to pardon Morton. What? And even more bizarrely, in the circumstances, Morton decided to accept it this time. Really? Okay, that's that's a... 
very big surprise. I assumed he would stay in France trying to find another Lancastrian. I, I can't believe he came back to England. Now that's courageous. Yes, it is. He, he's definitely on the side of royalty. He thinks pe- people have to stick with the king because otherwise the whole country goes to hell in a handcart. And when Henry VI was available, he went with him. Oh, and now that he's he was, not... he's the legal king. king. But now Edward's the legal king, so I will support him. Oh. Yeah, that seems to be his thinking. Okay. Uh, and he's not just planning to accept Edward as king and then go and play bishops again, or go and play prebentaries again. He was planning to serve him. He... He really doesn't like being out of the loop. <laughs> okay. If things are going on, he wants to be in the middle of it. He was quickly accepted as a close advisor of Edward. Really? Within a year, he was made Master of the Rolls, which is third in importance after the King and the Lord Chancellor. Within a year? I mean, he's gone from a tainted traitor to third in command within a year. Wow. He got back his ecclesiastical posts, and in 1473 he took charge of the Great Seal. So there's no greater proof that Edward trusted him than that. Wow. Later, in 1473, Morton was dispatched to Burgundy to engage in secret anti-French negotiations with Charles the Bold, King Matthias Corvinus of Hungary, and Frederick the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian's dad. Now, that's the one who got paid in clothes in a sort of yes. smart, smart yourself up type way. You don't look like a king, and if we give you money, you're going to spend it on bad things. Here's some clothes. Yeah, that's all we remember about him, really, isn't it? <laughs> as with so many of these leagues, it all fizzled out, as all the participants had their own projects that were keeping them busy. So Edward went it alone and declared war on France in 1475. Edward and his army visited Agincourt, as tourists as much of any as many things. And then Morton and three other councillors were dispatched to Louis to talk terms. And this all sounds very similar to Henry VII's excursion to France. Yeah. Wander about a bit and then ask for money. Yeah. Morton passed on Edward's terms, 75,000 crowns within 15 days, an annual pension of 50,000, and the Dauphin should marry Edward's daughter, Elizabeth of York. And it turns out that Louis already had the money ready, which is curious. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I imagine him opening a suitcase and it being stuffed with money. There's exactly 75,000 in here. You can count it. <laughs> it almost seems that with this invasion, as we speculated with Henry's, a lot seems to have been planned by the two sides in advance. Yes. And then England and France lived happily until the death of Charles the Bold of Burgundy when he had his face eaten off by wolves. That's <laughs> the main thing to talk about him. And there was a, a succession crisis in Burgundy since Louis was planning to take back Burgundy for France. And we've heard all about this just a little while ago with Margaret of Burgundy. Mm-hmm. Edward IV sent Morton to Louis XI to say, what will you give me to keep out of this succession crisis? <laughs> Money, please. <laughs> and Louis agreed to everything, including paying the ransom of Margaret of Anjou. So she is now finally out of the picture. <laughs> and Morton was a force to be reckoned with, because it's, it's no wonder that Edward IV relied on him for negotiations. <laughs> a French ambassador came to England in 1480 for diplomatic talks. And it soon became apparent to Morton that the ambassador intended to avoid talking about what Morton particularly wanted to talk about, and it's not important what it was now. Morton was so forthright, and we could use the neutral word forthright rather than aggressive, (laughs) that the poor ambassador became terrified and thought of running away. Wow. The ambassador tried to play for time, but Morton went to his house and frog-marched him to the notary, (laughs) <laughs> and the ambassador was forced to agree to Morton's demands, even though he hadn't been given permission from France to do so. You think, God, what was Morton like? Yeah. And when the poor man got back to France, Louis had him put on trial for compromising the security of France. Oh, dear. You don't understand. He had a sword at my throat. 
well, I don't think the defence that John Morton made me do it was, was just impressed anybody. No. Despite having done this podcast for a few years now, I still feel that clergymen are soft, gentle people. Yes. <laughs> we, should, we know they're not. 1478, Morton was made Bishop of Ely. So a nice little learner there. And yeah, probably a little bit closer than St David's. To show his spirituality, presumably emphasising that he wasn't just taking the job for the immense wealth it would bring, he walked the last 18 miles to Ely barefoot and in a simple tunic. And that was in January, when it's cold out east. And he's nearly 60 at this point. Oh, that's not a smart move. <laughs> no. We Don't cover a lot of his life before we get to Henry the Seventh. Um, don't worry, he's got plenty of time yet. He lives to a ripe old age, so obviously he doesn't catch cold and, and die. Wow. Despite the penance of his walk to Ely, the celebratory feast consisted of venison, swan, roe deer, pheasant, stork, rabbits, plovers, cranes, larks, and a peacock. And again, where are the vegetables? <laughs> no vegetables. Nobody wants vegetables. What's a plover? No. Uh, it's a bird. Oh, okay. I know it's such a gout on a plate again, isn't it? There's just <laughs> it's some time for... Oh my god. Restaurants should start putting platters out as those kind of descriptions. Gout on a plate, you know, for anything meat lovers. <laughs> it's just gout on a plate. <laughs> you never ever hear of a vegetable in any of these things. No. I mean perhaps they just didn't bother listing them, but hmm. And when you do see salad, quite often it's something in a gelatin. It has nothing to do with a vegetable. And I know that uh, Elizabeth sprinkled lots of sugar on her salad, didn't she? Yes. But again, mm. not necessarily vegetables. Mm. Yeah. We don't know much about his ecclesiastical work in Ely. I know I have been to Ely Cathedral and you can see that the cathedral was very badly damaged during the Civil War. A lot of the statues are missing their heads. Aww. So it's possible that the records were lost then. I think there might have been. Right. But given all his other responsibilities, it does seem unlikely he could have given his full attention to the job. Yeah. On the 9th of April, 1483, King Edward IV died suddenly. And Morton's world turned upside down again, as with many, many people. But he was... By that time, trusted by the Yorkists, so I think Richard would have taken him on, wouldn't he? If Morton would have accepted that. Oh, he didn't! Mm. Ooh! Yeah, interesting. A couple of contemporary sources said that Edward IV was suffering from melancholy and just took to his bed and died, which is not something I've ever come across before. No, me either. I thought it was all to do with his eating and that. drinking and... yeah. His indulgences. Hmm. Yeah. And Morton may have been there when Edward died. We saw the picture of Henry VII's deathbed in Hugh Dennis's episode. There were about 14 people huddled around. So it's not beyond the realms of speculation that Morton was there at Edward's end. He certainly inspected the body in his clerical capacity, not out of morbid curiosity. Oh, I was going to say, why? <laughs> um, I don't know why the clergy have to inspect the body, make sure he's dead, I suppose. Mm. Morton was among the councillors who set the date for Prince Edward's coronation on Sunday, May the 4th. Star Wars Day. Ooh, May the 4th be with you. Well, probably not why they chose that date. <laughs> and, and then all the Woodville Richard manoeuvring started up. Morton was Bishop of Ely, so he could have gone to Ely, kept his head down and got on with the bishopy stuff. Doesn't sound like he would ever do that, though. No, he chose to stay in London. And I think he was just one of those people who just have to be in the centre of things. He'd just be itching for the news if he was out in Ely. Instead, I want to be right there and get in trouble with the rest of them. Yes, yes. I don't think he minded that. As long as he was there, <laughs> it didn't matter which side he was on. <laughs> he was one of Edward IV's executors, but on the 7th of May, that's three days after Edward V's coronation should have taken place, Archbishop Borchier sequestered all Edward IV's possessions. And um, we'll have to do an, a cameo on the Archbishop because I want to know what he's up to. Yeah. Why would he? Hmm. 
Interesting. Well, I deliberately didn't look into it because I thought, yeah, we'll do a cameo and find out then. Okay. It's a teaser. The Duke of Buckingham, and more of him later, obviously had a quiet word with Morton, testing how he would feel if Richard were to take over. And Morton always sided with whoever had or the seemed legal. to have the most legitimacy, yeah. Right. Unless there was no alternative. Sort of like William Cecil. Yeah. The legitimate heir was young Edward V. And he made that quite clear to Buckingham. And Hastings now joined Morton in opposing Richard's takeover of the throne. And now we hit a famous scene. There was a meeting in the tower with Richard, Archbishop Rotherham. And that's another one who implacably opposed Richard becoming king. The book I read said William Stanley, but it's Thomas, isn't it? Yes. Definitely. Lord Hastings and John Morton. Shakespeare made an exchange between Richard and Morton in Richard III. So, OK, you be Gloucester then, you be Richard, and I'll be Morton. My Lord of Ely. My Lord? When I was last in Holborn, I saw good strawberries in your garden there. I do beseech you send for some of them. Marry and will, my Lord, with all my heart. Exit Ely. <laughs> That's, That's it. it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but this exchange came from Thomas More's History of Richard III, so it wasn't made up by Shakespeare, although it could have been made up by Thomas More, and probably was. And there's an addendum to this story that Richard suffered an allergic reaction to the strawberries and put that down to witchcraft and accused Morton of trying to poison him. <sighs> Did he actually do that? I doubt it. I doubt it. And I suppose we shouldn't, we shouldn't blame more for weaving in fictitious events which are meant to create more reality to the scene because the history of Richard III is more a historical novel than actual history. Yes. So they, put, they always put in these little conversations, didn't they? That's what I always struggle with with Philippa Gregory. She does some historical documentary kind of things and then she mm. does historical fiction. And sometimes your brain gets confused when you start <laughs> writing stuff later. Wait. I get very annoyed when you send off a book and then it arrives and you think, it's a novel. It's a oh. novel. There's so many. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm, they don't always make it clear on the well-known online shop. Yeah. Anyway, this business about, about strawberries, where Sans of Richard is trying to get Morton out of the way. But in the real meeting, it was Richard who went out for a while. Morton was there when Richard came back into the room. Since Thomas More who is obviously not an unbiased source, said he returned, quote, all changed with a wonderful sore, angry countenance, knitting the brows, frowning and fretting, and gnawing on his lips, and so sat him down in his place. All the lords much dismayed, and saw marvelling of this manner of sudden change, and what thing should him ail? Then, when he had sitten still for a while, then he began... What were they worthy to have that compass and imagine the destruction of me, being so near of blood unto the king and protector of his royal person and his realm? Unquote. And you think their blood must have run cold. Yes. This <laughs> we're all about to die. Richard said that the queen was attacking him with witchcraft, and as proof of this, he pulled his sleeve back to reveal his withered arm. The one that's always been withered. Well, that's what Hastings was apparently about to point out. <laughs> But obviously he thought, no, probably best not. But anyway, Hastings was taken out and beheaded there and then. Yes. Stanley was put under house arrest and Morton and Rotherham were sent to the tower. And they would have been executed too, but you don't generally execute bishops. Richard said he'd done this because they were all treasonous. Technically you are treasonous. At the moment, yes. Yeah. But, yes, the Cronin Chronicle reported, quote... In this way, without justice or judgment, the three strongest supporters of the new king were removed. And with all the rest of his faithful men expecting something similar, those two dukes, as Gloucester and Buckingham, thereafter did as they wanted, unquote. And although Richard had initially accused them of treason, those charges were quietly dropped. Hmm. This was all done secretly, because two days after Morton's arrest... The Mercer Company was wondering how much to provide for the coronation of, of the king. And that's Edward, not Richard. So they decided to ask Morton, because they had no idea he'd been arrested. 
Oh. Oh, it was that quiet. Mm. Okay. After that, it was rumoured that he was dead. But he wasn't, because otherwise this would be quite a short episode. And a couple of weeks later, Richard was crowned king. Oxford University sent an entreaty for Morton's release. Quote, the bowels of our mother, the university. And I don't think it's nice to speculate on your mother's bowels, is it? No. <laughs> like Rachel weeping for her children, are moved with pity over the lamentable distress of this her dearest son, unquote. That is a very unpleasant picture, that the bowels are weeping. <laughs> it really is quite nasty. Yeah. <laughs> yes, pick, pick your metaphors. Yes. Please, Oxford University. But Richard knew he already had an enemy in Morton, and on top of that, he just locked them in the tower, so he's, that's not the way to ingratiate yourself with people. Nope. So Richard could hardly expect a change of heart from Morton now. And here, Richard made a mistake. But to give him his due, it was hardly one that he could have foreseen. He placed Morton into the custody of the Duke of Buckingham oh. on his estates in Brecon in Wales. Yeah, a nice ah. long way off. <laughs> Wrong person! <laughs> it seems that he was expecting Buckingham to talk Morton round to becoming a staunch Ricardian. Not going to happen. You know what? Morton was looked up to, so if Richard could turn him, it could get yeah. him on his side, it would give his regime more seeming leg legitimacy. But no, it wasn't what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe Richard was thinking, well, he went over from Henry VI to my brother... What's yeah. stopping him doing something similar now? But the difference was that Henry VI and his son were both dead. Yes. In 1471, there was nowhere else to go. But Edward V was, at this time, presumably still alive. Yeah. Which made me think, if Richard did kill his nephews, did he do it to ensure that Morton would go over to his side when there was no other choice? In other words, the princes in the tower, was it all Morton's fault? <gasps> oh... Anyway, that's something to pass on to Philippa Langley, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> there we are, sort that one out. And while we're on the subject of the princes, at this time Morton is willing to defy Richard in favour of Edward V. Just three months later, he turned his allegiance to Henry Tudor, which is an odd move in itself for someone so keen on legitimacy, since Henry yeah. is way out there, really, isn't he? Yeah. But he must surely have assumed at this point that there was no other choice and that Edward V was no more. Yeah, but then why wouldn't he choose Richard? Because Richard now would be the legitimate king. He's been crowned. Well, unless he thought Richard had killed him, in which case Richard would be out of the question. Mm. Yeah. Morton wouldn't follow him then. Well, Edward killed Henry VI. No, he died of melancholy and displeasure. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know whether the princes in the tower died of melancholy. Possibly not. It has been said that Morton sided with Henry because he had natural antipathy to the Yorkists, but he'd happily served under Edward IV, and he was all set to serve under Edward V. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't it. And he was not alone in his disaffection with Richard. There are some 400 named rebels in Richard's reign... That's the named ones, not just the common and garden ones. And it's interesting to note how many people were removed from the commissions for the peace in 1483 because Richard couldn't trust them. I don't have exact numbers, but it certainly went up considerably that year. And although these people might not have been loyal to Richard, they were a disparate set of people. What they needed was someone to bring them all together under a common cause. And we said on several occasions that there were time in history where we'd have liked to have been a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was at Buckingham's place in Brecon. Because his remit was to talk Morton round. Yeah. How then did it come about that Morton talked Buckingham round? You know, you could be king. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is that what he said to him? Oh, I thought he might have said... Well, you're going to be second to Richard, aren't you? But Hastings thought he might be second to Richard, didn't he? He oh. thought he was Richard's best buddy. We've got two Look arguments here. Look what happened here. to him. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So, yes, bribery and blackmail, really, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> 
But it also may have been that Morton was pushing on an open door. Buckingham may already have been having his doubts about Richard. They'd had a dispute about an inheritance, because, you know, <laughs> there's all these people who aren't short of a bob or two that have these big disputes about money, isn't it? Yes. And then Richard may, had made some cutting remarks suggesting that Buckingham might next claim the usurped rights of the House of Lancaster, presumably suggesting that Buckingham was intended to use his closeness to the king to make all sorts of demands and to get lots and lots of money. And this seems quite a trivial reason for turning against someone, but people do things for trivial reasons, yes, especially they if they're in the nobility. Hmm. But Richard had promised Buckingham the earldom of Hereford, and it now looked as if Richard was backpedalling on that. Polydor Virgil said that the only reason Buckingham had backed Richard was to get the earldom of Hereford. I'm not sure why, because he's the Duke of Buckingham. You can't get much higher than that. No, but maybe more money? More money, yeah, more kudos. But it now looked as if that wasn't going to happen, and he was perhaps regretting ever having got involved. That was the theory. The problem with this reading of events is that Richard was going to give Buckingham the earldom of Hereford. It was either going through Parliament or was going to do so, the next Parliament. But however it was, it still seems extraordinary that Buckingham, presumably on the say-so of Margaret Beaufort, wrote to Henry Tudor saying, get on over here now, marry Elizabeth of York and get on that throne. Push, push. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would surely have been Morton's doing since he was linked to Margaret. Oh, you think so? Well, Mort Morton was the one that was there. Yeah. Yeah. He had Buckingham's ear. Yeah. So. And Thomas More put all the blame or praise on Morton. Okay. And then it looks as if Moore is going to tell us something really incendiary about it. But unfortunately, that's where the history of King Richard III suddenly finishes. What? <laughs> so, I, I, let me tell you this. Dot, 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 dot. Oh, <laughs> it just stops. no. Yes. So thanks, thanks, Moore. Uh, <laughs> I like you even less now. Well, maybe he died because Henry VIII was cutting off his head. Ah, uh, that would be a good excuse. Yeah. yeah. I really wanted to finish, but... <laughs> Well, thanks. Thanks, Henry. Edward Hall has Morton telling Buckingham that Richard has become a tyrant, that he killed the princes in the tower, and that he, Buckingham, should take the crown. So, Edward Hall took your theory. Mm -hmm. I can't really say it's my theory. I've, I've read Edward Hall. <laughs> <laughs> well, Buckingham tries to excuse his role in Richard's usurpation saying that he didn't trust the Queen's relatives and thought that if Richard didn't use her, the Woodvilles would. He says that he also believed Richard's claim that the princes were illegitimate, but he'd since found out that it wasn't true. And he agrees that it was Richard who had the princes murdered, said he knew nothing about it at the time. Right. And now he just wants out. And he goes on to say that he was riding out of London, thinking that maybe he'd be king himself... But he met Margaret Beaufort. And by the sound of it, she's just wandering about in the road and he sort of comes across her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi! <laughs> and she asked him to intercede with Richard on her son's behalf so that he could come back to England. But Buckingham says when he got home, he had a bit of a think and realised that instead he'd make that son of hers king. Wait, I thought Buckingham wanted himself to be king. No, he's had a rethink, oh. having met Margaret. This is oh. all via Edward Hall. Yeah. And Edward Hall has every reason to want Henry Tudor to appear to be the only rightful yes. successor. Yes. Yes, he does. Even his enemies could see it. In Hall's account, it was Buckingham who convinced Morton to back Henry. Not the other way round. Mm. Moore's account has been more believed since he lived in Morton's household when he was young and so he might have got it straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> yeah. Some have said it was actually Morton who wrote the book published by Moore. The, really? The Richard III one. But, in fact, it wasn't published by Moore. It wasn't finished. So it wasn't published till after Moore's death. So yeah. It, seem, it seems unlikely. Hence why it just stopped. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, in other words, we're no clearer than when we were, at the, we were at the beginning, which seems to be the way everything happens. Anyway, the Buckingham Rebellion. The traditional naming of the Buckingham Rebellion after him 
has been labelled a misnomer, with John Morton and Reginald Bray more plausible leaders. It is surprising it's not called Morton's Rebellion, since we know that Richard held him responsible, since the price on his head went from £100 to 1,000 marks, which by my calculation is about £660. Wow. Richard III accused Morton of trying to poison him. He was accused of employing the necromancer called Thomas Nandyke, who had been at Brecon with Buckingham and Morton. And more of this gentleman in a cameo episode, because I got rather interested in him and got <laughs> sidetracked. <laughs> Richard did seem to leap to the idea of witchcraft very quickly. Yes. If something goes wrong, witchcraft or poison, yeah. Dark forces, yeah. Morton must have been very disappointed when the uprisings that had been planned to happen together instead took place in a haphazard way. Buckingham found himself on the wrong side of the flooded River Severn, and then his troops deserted him. And for disappointed, I should think we could probably read terrified. Morton must have been terrified. <laughs> He'd not only rebelled against Richard, but had turned his right-hand man against him. Yeah. And Morton, quote, secretly disguised in the night, departed and came to Ely, where he found money and friends, and so sailed into Flanders, unquote. Smart. So he's off again. Yeah, I think so. By 1484, all Morton's lands were in the hands of others. But Richard was having trouble maintaining the loyalty of his men, and there are several examples of him handing lucrative posts to people only to attempt them later when they turned against him. And Morton wasn't kicking his heels in Flanders. He went back to college. Oh, sounds like me. <laughs> yes, I was about to say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Clocking up those degrees. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've discussed why Buckingham rebelled, but Morton's actions are strange too. He'd put his trust in someone he'd never met and whom he presumably knew little about apart from information coming via Richard Bray that was coming from Henry Tudor's mother. And can you trust the opinions of a mother about their son? Of course he's going to sound wonderful. Hmm. So why did Morton turn to Henry? Well, it might be as simple as there was no one else. Yeah. You've got Henry, you've got Richard. And it wasn't going to be Richard. Well, you had the De La Poles, except they were under Richard. They were le loyal yeah. to him. Hmm. 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 Meanwhile, in Brittany, Henry Tudor was gathering quite a following. Richard had tried to persuade Duke Francis of Brittany to hand him over, but Francis was none too keen. But by September of that year, the Duke was taken ill and his treasurer, Pierre Landet, took over. Sometimes Landet, sometimes Landois, I've discovered. Oh. <laughs> yeah. He was more amenable to Richard's advances, for reasons we'll discover, because I thought we might do a cameo episode about him as well. We've got a lot of cameo episodes <laughs> lined up. <laughs> However, Morton got to hear how Henry was in danger. And I had hoped that when we did Morton, we'd discover how he got to here, given that he's in Flanders. Yes. We don't. Oh. But if many of Richard's men weren't loyal to him, there could easily have been a mole in the court who could have contacted Morton. Anyway, Morton mm -hmm. sent Christopher Erswick to warn Henry, and so Henry and Erswick did that headlong rush into France just right. minutes before Londay's men... Snagged him. ...were after them. Yeah. Henry was now in France, and this was not good news for Richard. In October, Henry met Charles VIII, who agreed to pay for the invasion and provide him with those cracked troops we were hearing about in his episode. The really dodgy, clapped-out old ones. That <laughs> <laughs> quite expendable. It's thought that Morton was involved in these negotiations, and mainly based on the fact that he'd negotiated with the French before, so it seems a sensible choice. Yeah. And he, he negotiated well with the French before. Not yes, what he needed. Had so. one, of them, one of them in tears. <laughs> <laughs> It would be quite handy for Richard. No, it wouldn't. It would be quite handy for Henry. I haven't done that for a while. It would be quite <laughs> handy for Henry to have a good general on his team. Someone like, oh, I don't know, John de Vere? The problem was that de Vere was a prisoner at Ham Castle. Oh, right. 
and Richard was planning to bring de Vere back to the Tower where he could keep an eye on him. In fact, he moved from Nottingham to Canterbury to greet his prisoner. Yeah. He was going out to collect him himself. Doesn't trust anybody else to do it? Probably not. Or maybe, yeah, maybe he. it's reached that point where he really doesn't trust his people. Mm-hmm. He sent Sir Robert Brackenbury over to bring him home. And we've come across Brack- Brackenbury before when we did Sir James Tyrrell's cameo. He was implicated by Thomas More in the murder of the princes. And he was later killed at Bosworth. Richard didn't think Calais was strong enough to hold de Vere. Or maybe he didn't think it was loyal enough. Mm. And I'm sort of extrapolating now from what happens after. Because we know, since we've done de Vere, that not not only he escapes from prison, but he brings his jailer with him. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Sir James Blount, along with Sir John Fortescue, the gentleman porter of Calais. <laughs> Carrying off <laughs> <up> luggage. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody has to do it. <laughs> and we've long been wondering how this situation came about, because it seems to be a rerun of Morton's imprisonment with Buckingham, yes. the prisoner converting the jailer. Yes. And it seems that, again, Morton was the missing link. Really? He had been friends and a fellow exile with Fortescue's uncle, oh. also called Sir John Fortescue, which I found very confusing when I started to write a cameo about them yeah. and didn't, couldn't tell which was which. So I stopped. Yes. So you're not getting a cameo okay. about them. <laughs> <laughs> Morton and Fortescue Senior had drawn up those bills of attainder together. So that's why both of them had to leave the country. Fortescue had remained a staunch Lancastrian. Although that was mainly because he refused to believe that the succession would go down the female line. Ah, nice. Although, I don't know whether he sides with Henry VII. Probably not, on that, no, if that's his uh, criteria. Yeah. Morton and Fortescue Jr. were neighbours back in England. So surely it must have been Morton via Fortescue who enabled de Vere's escape. I mean, it's speculation, but it's not that far-fetched. No, it's reasonable. Hmm. If we didn't speculate, we wouldn't have anything to talk about at all. (laughs) Several people with connections to Morton were organising uprisings back in England, although they weren't successful, and the participants had to flee to Henry Tudor in France. And Richard knew full well who was behind them. So Morton is a very pivotal figure in the revolt against Richard. So when I, when I said he was sort of underhanded and intriguey, he, he really is. He had to be. He was underhanded and intriguey. So what was Richard to do about Morton? I mean, surely it would be better if Morton were wiped from the face of the earth. Yes. And I bet, I bet he had a go at that. But what Richard did was quite surprising. He pardoned him. Wow. It had worked for Edward IV. Why shouldn't it work for Richard? Well, Morton hadn't asked to be pardoned. It came completely out of the blue. And not only did Richard pardon him, he tried to turn him. Because several people were sent out to have a little chat with Morton. Help him see what a lovely man Richard was. And wouldn't you like to come back and be part of the court? We know how much you like being in the centre of things. You can have the privy seal. Hmm. But Morton wasn't interested. And if he didn't suspect it to be a trap, well, he'd have been an idiot, I think. Some of the people whom Richard sent later worked very happily with Morton under Henry VII, showing that perhaps they weren't quite as loyal as Richard thought they were. Or Morton has a golden tongue and can turn anybody to whatever he wants. Yeah, I mean, if he can make the French ambassador cry, he surely can do anything to anybody. And he got the impression perhaps they didn't make too much effort to turn Morton. Annoyingly, we don't know what Morton was doing to orchestrate these uprisings, since uh, conspiracies don't leave much of a paper trail, as we've said before. But we can assume he was very much part of it by the fact that Richard singled him out for special attention. But Richard had shot himself in the foot with Morton in that he had pardoned him, and yet Morton was still (laughs) a loose cannon. He was free to cause trouble, presumably no longer with that bounty on his head. I've never heard of one being undone, but can you undo a pardon? I don't know. The other Richard said, no, I have my yeah. fingers crossed. Mm. Hmm. We're pretty sure that Morton visited Paris, where he recruited Richard Fox to the cause. 
And he also went to Rome, and it's quite possible, although there's no evidence for it except that he was in Rome at the right time, that he went there to get the dispensation from the Pope for the marriage between Henry and Elizabeth of York. And he probably did this when it was rumoured that Richard was planning to marry her himself on that time when Richard was forced to say, no, 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 marry my niece? Oh, no, that's going to be creepy. Unlike a lot of Henry's cronies, Morton didn't accompany Henry Tudor either on the first unsuccessful invasion or to Bosworth. I was going to say, because he never got mentioned. No, he's an intriguer, not a fighter, I think. He was back in England in time for the coronation in October. And he stood at the king's left during the ceremony. And I thought this was quite touching. He sometimes held the crown for the king since it was very heavy and the ceremony was very long. He attended Parliament on the 7th November and received back all his attainted goods at the end of that month. And the following March, he became Lord Chancellor and he was given the Great Seal by Henry. In the presence of Uncle Jasper, the Bishop of Exeter, Peter Courtney and Sir Christopher Erswick. And that's the third time he's been trusted enough to look after the Pope. This is all I want to do. Just give me the thing. (laughs) I like stamping things. I'll look after it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it is very satisfying, stamping things. (laughs) So finally, we've reached Henry VII's reign. So next time, we'll see how it all went. (laughs) But he's well. He must be well into his sixties wow, by now. He's an old so he really, he really is literally an old man wow. by the standards. Yeah, I mean now someone in their sixties is in their yeah. prime, but not then. Not then. And in my head, he was not that old. He does. He's not flagging. No, not at all. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we'll find out if he starts flagging yeah. next time, next week. Thank you for listening. Bye. Goodbye.